We do know that one of the four pillars of government currently is what is known as U universal health care. And uh, to have that discussion this morning with me, I have two gentlemen, and I'll start by introducing them. Dr. Jose Rono, who's next to me, co-founder and managing partner of ENK Consulting Firm. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we also have Dr. Mishek Ndirangu, who's the country director for AMREF uh, Health Africa in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Now, universal health care. Uh, still remains somehow a mystery and mystified for many Kenyans. Maybe yeah. would like to break it down. Let me start with you, uh, Dr. Mishek, because I know you have a foothold in quite a number of counties in Kenya. Um, in regards to what is universal health care, what are we looking at? What is it that we are trying to, uh, or rather, what is it that the government is trying to achieve? Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for that question. Uh, the conversation on universal health care has been going on for several months now. And I think initially there was a perception that it's more about financing and NHIF and all that. Mm. But it's about four things. It's about access. Mm -hmm. It's about quality. It's about financial protection. And also it's about accountability. I can, I'd like to simplify this uh, so that anyone should be able to understand it. You're a Kenyan. I'm a Kenyan. Access is about when you are sick, uh, are you able to get to a facility that is close enough to you, within half an hour you are able to get there, there are transportation mechanisms, it's not too far away from you. Mm -hmm. You know in this country there are people who live 50 kilometers from a health facility, so that's not access. So is it, that's the first part. The second part is quality. When you get there, do you get the type of services that you need, you know, with the right standards to make you well, to address your health problems? Or do you go to die in a facility or do you go to get more infections in that facility? Mm -hmm. That's quality of care. Mm -hmm. And let's assume you get well and now you have to pay for your for your for the services provided. For the service that you've been you've Do you have to sell your assets to pay for them? Your border border if you are a border border owner or to sell your farm implements and all that? Or are you financially protected so that then you are able, from your insurance, uh, you are able to pay for the services that have been offered to you. So that's financial protection and financing. And then finally, it's about accountability. Mm -hmm. The community where you come from, yourself and the community where you come from, do they understand what is UHC? Do they understand what the government commitments are to the people of Kenya in terms of UHC? Very soon, we'll have a benefits package, a health benefits package announced. Uh, do you, do you, when you are, you are unwell, do you understand what that benefit package entitles you to? Mm. And if there are challenges when you go to that facility we talked about and you find something is not there or is not well provided, how is that remedied? Where is the accountability in terms of access, in terms of quality, in terms of financial protection? Okay. Yeah, so that is universal health coverage. Uh, okay, yeah. and, and very well put and simplified. Let me come to you, Dr. Rono. And you have vast experience in the health sector. When we look at those four aspects, access, quality, affordability, accountability, uh, I would imagine the government would have to pick on the most critical to start with, or yeah. do they approach it from all four angles? So I think um, if, if you look at universal health coverage, there, there is a fundamental principle that it's, it's a rights-based approach to providing health care, that every Kenyan has a right to access to health care. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that every Kenyan should be entitled to an essential packet that is non-contributory in nature, um, in the sense that you don't need to go into your pocket to, be, to, to qualify for a certain benefit package. So if you look at those three, those aspects that uh, Dr. Meshak has mentioned about, you, you've got to address all of them together. You, you wouldn't be able to address quality in isolation and, and not access. touch and, and not uh, cater for access. So if you look at those parameters, um, you could think of for instance, if you look on the, on the, on the affordability aspect, um, you would want, I mean, best practice dictates that, you know, for you to go towards universal coverage, you need to reduce the contribution made by out-of-pocket payments to at least, you know, 15 to 20 percent of total healthcare expenditure. In Kenya, we are at 26 percent, meaning that we still have a lot of healthcare, a lot of our healthcare patches going through unplanned out-of-pocket payments. So that needs to be addressed. But then you, for you to generate you know, enough incentive for people to pre-plan and prepay for healthcare, they need to be assured that the quality is good enough so that by the time they seek the healthcare, it's worth the 
prepayment they made. Mm. So that has to go hand in hand. Um, so all these aspects need to be addressed one um, concurrently. But I must mention that if you look at the UHC roadmap, I mean, we are not the first country to go into rolling out universal health coverage. Several other countries have done pretty well in this path. You could think about Thailand and a few other countries that have walked this path before. And what they have done is really to say, let's, let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what is, what is UHC for Kenya? Let's define it first in terms of what is the package, what is what do we want to offer all the Kenyans? Mm. What is it that we can afford? And the benefit package that is being developed right now is one step in that direction. Once we define that, then we test it out in a controlled environment where we test for the affordability and the ability of healthcare providers to actually offer that package mm. to, a, to a level of quality that is acceptable. And then now roll it out to the entire country. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, Dr. Ndirango. Access may not necessarily or only mean having access to a hospital. Are there what I'd call low-lying fruits that the government can take advantage of? For instance, community health, where you train individuals in a community where even if a hospital facility is not available, they can administer what we'd call maybe like first aid uh, that would now help you get to the facility. Yes, uh, yes, Michael. Uh, when you talk about access, it's, uh, it's equitable access. Uh, even the ones in hard rich popular areas are able to access services in the shortest time possible. And for us to succeed in this UHC journey, it's very important that uh, we strengthen the primary healthcare system. And that primary healthcare system really is about what we say level one community, level two dispensary, level three health center. And if I talk about the community, remember, health is manufactured, is made in the home, in the community, and repaired in the facility. 80% uh, of health is about community, what happens in the community, what happens in the home. 20% is about what happens in the facility when it's broken. Uh, and as Ambrose Health Africa, we are very passionate about the role that community health workers are able to play in this field. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen programs that we are supporting, like some supported by the Global Fund. You know the Global Fund. And in Western Kenya, you know, Western Kenya is malaria endemic. And let's assume that uh, uh, you are a parent in Western Kenya and your child, a uh, four-year-old child, develops a FIFA at night, at two in the night. The FIFA really goes high and you don't know what to do. The facility is 12 kilometers away. It's, there are no matatos at night. Your it's 2 a.m. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> now, this is what is happening. Uh, you talk to a community health worker who is your neighbor on the phone, they come at that point, at that time, they prick your child, test for malaria, that's what is happening, and if it's positive, they provide a treatment for that. If it's not malaria, it's something different or it's more complicated, then they support you to make sure that uh, there's referral, you're able to get the nearest health facility. So community health workers have the ability to provide uh, support towards uh, prevention through education, uh, early diagnosis, not just for malaria, but for diabetes, hypertension. Uh, and with early diagnosis, then you're able to get uh, save lives to start with. But then you're also able to get people into care when we still can help. The other example is uh, where we are seeing community health workers walking into households, testing blood pressure. And for the first time, people are under the, their blood pressure is elevated and they are referred to the nearest facility and they get into long-term care. Do you know what happens when you stay with the blood pressure, high blood pressure for six years and it's not detected? You damage your brain, you damage your kidneys, you get a stroke later, and then you, we want to use a CT scan to help you. Yet, if we invest in primary care, early diagnosis, screening and early diagnosis and getting people into proper care early enough, then that is a type of balanced investment we should be working should on be looking as a country. Um, Dr. Rono, what does it take to have that community health care, um, people trained, um, equipped with whatever they need? Like now he's talking about testing blood pressure. You definitely need some form of equipment to do mm. that. Uh, for us to ensure that at the community level, health care is already taken. The primary health care is, is taken care of. Um, so just, just, just to mention that um, as ENK Consulting Firm, we've had the privilege to develop an investment case for community health, which really addresses the question you're asking. What, what, is, what is required to, to set up 
community health in Kenya mm. and what is the return if we put in the money. The good news is that for every shilling we put into community health, we get about nine and a half shillings back. So it means it's a, it's a good return on investment. It's worth investing in. And you, you, what Kenya has is um, a community health strategy, which was initially developed in 2006 and then revised in 2014, which outlines what community health should offer in terms of um, interventions in terms of what equipment community health workers should have, what um, kind of training they should undergo. So this is very well articulated. The, 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 the missing link is in actually financing that um, process. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, um, from our estimates, you need, about, you need about 25 billion shillings over 10 years. So it means every year you need about 2 billion shillings into community health. Which, which I think is, is modest, considering that these are people who are reaching out to every household in the country. And it's, not, it's important to mention that it's not just adequate to have community health workers paid, which we, and which we have not attained to the optimum level, mm -hmm. but to actually have them equipped with necessary equipment to go into, different, into homes and address um, the challenges in, in the individual homes. Okay. So in terms of, as a ballpark figure, I think you need about 2 billion shillings every year mm -hmm. to go into community health, but the reassurance is that the, the impact in terms of life saved and the impact of those lives into the economy is almost tenfold, mm -hmm. therefore justifying uh, investments into the community investment. health. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ari, looking at the investment, and he has mentioned rightly that it's a worthwhile investment. It is costly, and of course it's, it has a ripple effect, but looking at the savings, what does it save us over time? That investment. Uh, I think I would like to say it literally saves our country because if we don't invest in primary health care now, if we don't invest in community health workers and other frontline health workers now, uh, then what you realize is that uh, a lot of gains we are making, we have made in the health sector over the many years will be eroded. Why do I say that? Uh, we have spent uh, decades fighting malaria, fighting HIV, fighting TB, and over the years, these are coming down. But as that happens, we have now the non-communicable diseases uh, rising. And you know they are chronic, they are very, very expensive to manage. So what will happen is, uh, if we don't invest in the primary health care system, uh, then we'll have all the gains we have made eroded through the heavy cost of managing our chronic illnesses and other conditions that are much, much cheaper when managed at an early stage. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the one thing I would say. It's literally saving our economy. It's literally saving our nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, uh, Rono is a health economist. You can, ju can just imagine how much that yeah. will erode our gross domestic GDP and all that if we don't Over invest yeah. in the primary health care, in okay. community health workers now. All right. And As part of primary health care, one of the things that needs to be done is just education to people. Because yeah. sometimes you'll find before you get to that uh, local, caregiver who possibly has the equipment and all that, mm -hmm. it may just be management that is required. Just mm -hmm. knowing. For instance, let's take a case of uh, high blood pressure, yeah. getting a headache. Um, they, I think they call it the silent killer Definitely. because yeah. you actually sure. don't know what's happening. So just education and information to people. Yeah. Is that something that maybe the government needs to invest in? Uh, because that would also now save us a lot more when within the household people yeah. are informed. Um, definitely. I think, I think a big part of healthcare is, is based on how well informed you are about your health. And um, as opposed to a few years back where infectious disease was a major challenge and the symptoms were pretty obvious, a lot of the non-communicable diseases are, are more you know, silent, as you mentioned. Mm. And that calls for education of the general public. And that you know, needs to be you know, pushed forward using multiple avenues. One could be the community health workers, one could be um, no, schools, hospitals, perhaps. schools. And, and, and one thing that I think needs to happen is to actually have um, the curriculum, even in high schools, to teach people about non-communicable diseases. Because this is, this is a lifestyle change that you need to inculcate in young people way you know, early on in life. It, it's very hard to, to get someone to change their lifestyle when they're you know, fairly advanced in, in, in age as opposed to when they're younger. So I think the, the education part is, 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 is key. And it, it's, it's, it's definitely worth uh, investment in because it, the downstream savings are quite uh, significant. Um, and just to give an example, um, 
in terms of if you look at the cost, several studies have been done to cost, you know, what is, I mean, to cost um, provision of healthcare for different diseases. So if you look at, for instance, um, treatment of a case of TB, it's about $180 uh, dollars just to treat an individual case. So if you compare that versus the education that needs to go into prevention of TB is way less. So it's definitely a justified investment to make. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe prudent mechanisms, Dr. Ndirango, that we can also implement, that the government can implement to ensure that this primary health care and health care generally is uh, widespread in Kenya. Uh, there are five things I would like to highlight very quickly that uh, I think we can do. Uh, of course, when the health benefits package is finally announced and launched, a lot of things will become clearer and we're involved in those conversations. Number one is uh, invest in frontline health workers, including community health workers. Mm -hmm. That's what we are saying. Invest in frontline health workers, let them be part of the formal health system with a scheme of service and paid like everyone else. Right now, they are volunteers, they should be workers. Number they should two, be paid. They should be paid. Mm -hmm. Number two is uh, invest in prevention and management of non-communicable diseases, the, high, the silent killers you're talking of, mm -hmm. the cancers, that all need to be detected early so that we actually save ourselves as a nation. And again, you see the frontline health workers are needed to do that. Mm -hmm. And the third idea is uh, let us strengthen the public health sector. It's important. Let me give you an example. When you talk about the National Hospital Insurance Fund, did you know that Although the public health sector, the number of health facilities in this country are about 8,600 and close to half of that are public facilities run by government, did you know that probably 85% of revenues or of claims uh, from NHIF go to the private sector and the public sector only gets 15%? So why? We have to strengthen the public health sector so that those, that facility that you remember, I give you the example, that you're walking to uh, with your son, with your child who is unwell, has the commodities they need, are able to manage quality and all that. Eh? They have the resources they need to actually deliver services because that's not the case at the moment. Mm -hmm. The number four is invest in quality improvement. Remember I told you that. UHC is about access, quality, financing, and accountability. So it's very important to, uh, as we do all this, to have, and there are established quality improvement initiatives that once a health facility applies over a couple of months, then you see even people are walking to that facility. Many more people are going there because they are happy with those services. And then finally, financial protection. That's the biggest thing, and I would say equitable financial protection, where we start with those who have been left behind. Uh, so I'm very happy, and this is where NHIF comes in, health insurance comes in, uh, and I'm very happy that uh, the government has really prioritized uh, this as one of the big four agenda. Uh, right now, only one out of three Kenyans have your insurance. The other two out of three, when you are sick, you start panicking. Will you buy food, will you pay fees, or will you seek treatment. So we need to address that and so that within the next four years, we can say nine out of ten or ten out of ten Kenyans have your insurance. You have insurance. I have. He has. Every Kenyan deserves that. They should have. They should. All right, gentlemen, we'll have yeah. to wind up there because yeah. of time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meshek Dirango, who is the country director for AMREF Health Africa in Kenya, and also Dr. Jose Rono, who is a co-founder and managing partner, ENK Consulting Firm. Thank you for